Welcome to the Bill Kelly Podcast, critical discussions in critical times. Here's your host, Bill Kelly. This is the Bill Kelly Podcast, critical discussions in these critical times. I am your host, Bill Kelly, and it's great to have you with us today. There has been a great deal of conversation, speculation, and let's face it, trepidation about just what this Trump administration, uh, which is going to be sworn in, of course, in January, is going to mean for Canada-U.S. relations, especially from an economic standpoint, and a lot of concern and speculation about exactly how this is going to roll out, Uh, probably fueled to a certain extent by the fact that we've seen the Trump Act before, certainly, and uh, we dealt with the good, the bad, and the ugly of some of those economic policies. And there's so many different facets to this, but let's, for the sake of, of Uh, brevity in this podcast, I want to talk about two things in particular. One is tariffs, and and then we're going to talk about American policy uh, towards trade as well. Now, tariffs are are, are not new. They've been around for a long, long time. It's uh, some people think a blunt instrument that some countries can use. And uh, during this past uh, election cycle in the United States, uh, Trump was pretty adamant that he was going to slap tariffs on everything, everything, Canada, China, Europe, everybody, you're going to get nailed 20%, 25% tariffs. Uh, which is a kind of a silly idea, but uh, the guy's going to be back in the White House, and we don't know exactly just how far he's going to go on this, because I think notwithstanding some advice to the contrary, in his first administration, he went ahead with some tariffs as well. Uh, blanket tariffs, such as he's talking about, most economists agree, could be an economic disaster, not just for Canada, and but for the you know, Americans themselves. And we saw examples of that in the first Trump administration uh, with some of the tariffs that Trump did try to... Uh, put forth, as well, especially when it came to Canada, um, vis-a-vis the auto industry, the, uh, the softwood lumber industry. Uh, you remember he put a tariff on, on Canadian aluminum, uh, figuring that this was going to you know harm them and help his own people. And uh, the biggest outcry that he got, if you recall from that, was from the American companies that said, whoa, 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 wait, we need that. We need Canadian aluminum. We can't do it as effectively and as cost-effectively as Canada can. We've got to have that. Uh, which causes, of course, the, the the folks on the American side to kind of backtrack a little bit. Same sort of thing with the auto industry. Uh, I, I think we can anticipate that there's going to be some tariffs, uh, but there seems to be a, a, a misunderstanding or a disconnect here about just how tariffs work. Um, you know, if if he put a, a tariff, for instance, on on Canadian whatever lumber, auto, aluminum again, if that would be the case, uh, it's not the consumer that pays for it directly. It's the people that are bringing that stuff into the country. So it hurts American companies when he instills tariffs like that and puts tariffs in place. I don't think he gets it. Uh, I'm hoping that there are going to be at least a few people in the Trump administration that are going to understand just how problematic uh, and punitive it can be to American industry. You know, and, and of course, it's always going to be when, you know, if there's going to be a tariff like that, you get into trade wars where there's going to be uh, some retaliation. Uh, with some of the things that Canadians uh, felt being victimized by the Trump administration previously, you may recall that the Canadian government instituted some tariffs, uh, you know, direct tariffs, small tariffs in specific areas uh, that hurt a number of states, uh, which may not have a huge impact on the federal government in their economic picture, but individual states that d- trade a great deal with Canada, uh, not just the border states. You'd think, okay, the northern states, and, and that's true. But you remember one of the uh, the tariffs Canada instilled was on uh, was on Tennessee whiskey, and 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 bourbon, uh, and that really hurt the industry. I guess we take a lot more of that stuff than we probably want to realize uh, that comes up to this country. So the outcry is from those industries down in the states to say, whoa, 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 you're you're hurting us more than you're hurting the Canadians. So I hope there's going to be a frank and honest discussion about just how tariffs can be used and. It's not to suggest, as, as many economists have said, look, at, you can't just say tariffs are all bad because used effectively and strategically on specific items, yeah, they can be effective. Uh, Canada and the United States, of course, you're talking about tariffs on Japanese auto parts and uh, automobile in the industry itself. Uh, and that's essentially because they try to uh, are going to try anyway to block the Chinese auto industry from, from flooding product into the uh, North American market. We'll see just how that goes. And the months and years ahead. So tariffs are going to be an important part of this, especially since Trump talked about it a great deal in uh, in his election campaign. The other, though, is is something that's a little more broad, and and I think it's something that we need to discuss here. And that, of course, is Trump's uh, idea about an America-first economy. Now, 
let's put this in perspective. This is not a new idea. Uh, even most recently, the Obama administration uh, developed an America first economic recovery policy. This is after, of course, the huge recession that uh, the whole world went through back in 2009, 2010. And uh, it, it's basically, it's an idea to say, look, we're going to build stuff here. We're going to hire Americans to do this and only Americans and only American products. And uh, I suppose one of the initial reasons to do something like that, because it, it really, I think, kind of instills a kind of a national pride and fervor that, yeah, we're America. We're the greatest country in the world. We don't need anybody else's help. We can do this all by ourselves. The problem with that, of course, is it's not really true in a 21st century economy that there has to be some give and take. And what we want to do and what we try to do, I guess, uh, when America has come out with a policy like this is, is do some negotiations and say, OK, we get where you're coming from on this. And we know why you're saying this and why you want to do this, but uh, let's talk about the ramifications before we start to institute some of these policies. Um, and that worked for the Obama administration and the Canadian government. Uh, there was some back and forth. And uh, the, the headlines, of course, that politicians make when they develop these policies and announce these policies is great. You know, we're going to get this done and here's the policy and get behind us. And, uh, and it worked. I mean, the economy in the United States did rebound nicely after that uh, traumatic recession that we all went through. Uh, not unlike, of course, what happened a couple of years later when Obama left the White House and, and Donald Trump got in there, he again started looking at something like the America First policy, uh, tried to, to actually lay that onto the auto industry. And, and that created its own sense of problems. And we'll talk about that in just a couple of seconds. And the Biden administration over the last four years, uh, President Biden made a lot of, of hay about, you know, America first. We're going to hire Americans. We're going to employ Americans and only Americans for some of this stuff. And and that may sell well on the campaign trail uh, and it may get you the headlines in, in the newspapers and, and on the talk shows. But the reality is, is whether the American presidents want to admit that uh, there is in the 21st century an interdependence between Canada, Mexico and the United States with the auto industry and with other countries to do with other aspects of the economy, too. And there has to be, I think, some allowance for that. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see just how this new Trump administration is going to handle that sort of thing. I mean, it can be problematic, and it's going to cause some consternation. You know, Trump's already talking about, once again, tearing up the North American trade pact, uh, maybe even booting Mexico out of it, uh, which is going to be an interesting debate. But how far is he going to go, and what kind of an impact is it going to have? Will common sense prevail? Uh, I'd like to think, yes, there's going to be smart people that are going to say, wait, 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 we can't really do that. But I don't know. And and that's maybe one of the things that I think is, is really concerning a lot of people right now. Uh, Trump is, especially with some of the announcements he's made about who he wants in his cabinet, is surrounding himself with, with loyalists, with sycophants who are simply going to rubber stamp whatever he says and do whatever he wants them to do. And that's not necessarily the best advice. I mean, the whole idea, I guess, of, of a cabinet is is to have... Uh, different sets of, of voices and different opinions and different perspectives uh, before you develop policy. I'm not so sure that's the process that's going to be happening as the uh, economy rolls out over the next four years and, and the impact it's going to have on Canada-U.S. relations. We are very interdependent. We saw that with the auto industry, didn't we? Where, you know, when you simply say, well, we're going to build, and Biden did this too, we're going to build cars right here in America. We don't need other countries to do this. We're going to build them in Detroit and build them in Kentucky and all these other places where these auto plants are, and that's going to satisfy the economy. Well, first of all, no, it doesn't. Uh, they can't develop this, the, the, the industry to the extent where it's going to be a U.S.-only industry because there already is an interdependence between Canada and the U.S. when it comes to auto parts and, and raw materials and labor. Uh, that, that impact the auto industry. Now, I don't know whether they're going to recognize that or not. So uh, if, if this, the common thread here seems to be, as, as we look forward to this, is, uh, well, we're not sure where we're going to go on that. And I think that's what causes an awful lot of the, the consternation that a lot of people are, are expressing these days, is how is this going to impact uh, Canada-U.S. relations? And more importantly, how is it going to impact the economy? And uh, you have to juxtapose those concerns with what's happening politically in this country. I mean, we know that probably in the next eight to 10 months, there's going to be an election federally here in Canada. Uh, it certainly looks as if there's going to be a change in government at this stage, if you're looking at some of the polling numbers. Uh, would a conservative government uh, be a more effective negotiator with the Americans? I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that's the case. I don't know that, that Trump necessarily 
uh, even uses a political ideology as, as a, a factor in these sorts of things. He just wants to be the guy on top. He wants to be the king of the hill, you know, the, the big rooster that crows in the barnyard. And he doesn't want necessarily to negotiate, and he's not looking for compromise. Uh, that seems to be his, his modus operandi in situations like that. So whether it's a Justin Trudeau government or a Pierre Polyev government that's negotiating, uh, Canada's better going to have to be on their guard. And they're going to, uh, first and foremost, they're going to have to do their homework and come to the table and, and say, look, at these are the ramifications. And don't forget that when these negotiations are happening, and they, it is inevitable, by the way, that there will be negotiations about the trade packs and, and auto industry and everything else uh, between this Trump administration and, and the Canadian government. It's going to happen. Uh, we don't know how it's going to happen or when it's going to happen. But the reality here is that we've got to understand that there is an interdependence. We have to make our American friends understand that. The, the good news is there are some allies down that side of the border, too. Uh, as we mentioned, the state governments that deal with Canada on a much more direct basis than maybe the, the U.S. federal government does are going to want to have a voice in those discussions and those negotiations as well. So it's, it's going to be a very, very difficult next few months. Uh, I guess clouded by the fact that, like I say, we may or may not have a change of government in this country and the impact and, and the and the attitude that the, any government, whether it's a, a liberal government or a conservative government, is going to have on Canada-U.S. relations. It, it's easy, and I suppose certainly sometimes uh, beneficial from a, a public relations standpoint, to talk tough and say, we're not going to stand for that. I'm not going to let them do that to us. We're going to stand up for Canada or we're going to stand up for the states, depending on which side. Uh, you're looking at this from. But the reality is, is that the negotiations and, and the discussions are finally hopefully going to lead to some place that's going to be mutually beneficial. We're not going to get everything we want, but we don't want to give up everything at the same time. So the, the concern, the nervousness that we're feeling on this side of the border about what a Trump administration is going to do is real. And it's it's legitimate given the fact that we just don't have the answers. But what we want to see is the Canadian side, when that does come to pass, that there's going to be those discussions, be prepared, understand that you're going to have to explain to an awful lot of people and publicly to the Canadian people and to the American people that this is a win-win situation. And if you want to start messing with it, uh, the whole thing could fall apart. And that's going to hurt both countries, maybe not on a national basis, but it's going to hurt economies in a lot of those states and a lot of the provinces here, too. So here's hoping. That, uh, well, it's a phrase that I guess we've used an awful lot. Common sense will prevail. And unfortunately, that's not always the case in politics, is it? We'll see. And we'll certainly talk about this a lot more in the uh, the days and weeks ahead. That's it for this edition of the podcast. Thanks so much uh, for being with us, too. You can catch us, of course, on Substack, on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts, really. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to click the notification bell, too. Until next time, I'm Bill Kelly. Good to have you with us. Until the next time. Stay in touch and stay informed. Brought to you by Wizens Law, personal injury lawyers. Listen, you didn't choose to get injured, but you can choose the right lawyer. Wizens Law, 905-522-1102 or wizenslaw.com.